in this learning outcome, which is learning outcome number six, we will talk about bone growth. During infancy, childhood, and adolescence, all bones throughout the body, they grow in thickness by oppositional growth, which we talked already about, and long bones lengthen by interstitial growth. Remember from the previous learning outcome that oppositional growth is due mainly to the deposition of extracellular matrix on the cartilage surface by chondroblasts, and that interstitial growth occurs by cell division of chondrocytes and also the continued secretion of cartilage extracellular matrix by these chondrocytes. The activity of the epiphyseal plate is the only way that the diaphysis can increase in length. As a bone grows, the chondrocytes will proliferate on the epiphyseal side of the plate, and new chondrocytes will replace older ones, which are then destroyed by calcification. Therefore, the cartilage is replaced by bone on the diaphyseal side of the plate. In this way, the thickness of the epiphyseal plate remains relatively constant, but the bone on the diaphyseal side increases in length. In a bone fracture, damages to the epiphyseal plate, the fractured bone may be shorter than normal once adult stature is going to be reached. And this is because damage to the cartilage, which is avascular, will accelerate the closure of the epiphyseal plate due to the cessation of cartilage cell division thus inhibiting the lengthwise growth of the bone. Just so that you understand what you're seeing in this image to the right, all of this is the epiphyseal plate, which is the area of the bone that is called the metaphysis and is located between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. Therefore, the epiphysis would be here on top and the diaphysis would be located on the bottom of this image. Like I said earlier, the growth in length of a bone, or more specifically of a long bone, involves interstitial growth of the cartilage on the epiphyseal side of the epiphyseal plate. And the replacement of cartilage with bone by endochondral ossification on the diaphyseal side of the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate is going to be a layer of hyaline cartilage in the metaphysis of a growing bone that consists of four different zones. They are the zone of resting cartilage, the zone of proliferating cartilage, the zone of hypertrophic cartilage, and the zone of calcified cartilage. So let's start with the zone of resting cartilage. This layer is nearest to the epiphysis and it will consist of small scattered chondrocytes. The term resting is going to be used because the cells, they do not function in bone growth, but they do rather anchor the epiphyseal plate to the epiphysis of the bone. So for this reason, it is called the zone of resting cartilage. The next zone is what we call the proliferating cartilage. And as you can observe, the chondrocytes in this zone, they're going to be slightly larger and they're going to be arranged like stacks of coins. These chondrocytes, they will undergo interstitial growth as they divide and they also secrete the extracellular matrix. This means that the chondrocytes in this zone will divide to replace those that die at the side of the epiphyseal plate that faces the diaphysis. So the side below this zone. Next, we have the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. This layer consists of large maturing chondrocytes that are going to be arranged in columns. The last zone is the zone of calcified cartilage. The final zone of the epiphyseal plate is only a few cells thick and it will consist mostly of chondrocytes that are dead because of the extracellular matrix around them being calcified. That's why it's called the zone of calcified cartilage. Osteoclasts will dissolve the calcified cartilage and osteoblasts and capillaries from the diaphysis will invade this area. The osteoblasts will then lay down the bone extracellular matrix, replacing the calcified cartilage 
by this process of endochondral ossification, which we covered already. As a result, the zone of calcified cartilage will become the new diaphysis that is firmly cemented to the rest of the diaphysis of the bone. Like cartilage, the bone can grow in thickness, which means in diameter, only by a positional growth. The first step at the bone surface, the periosteal cells will differentiate into osteoblasts, which secrete the collagen fibers and other organic molecules that form the bone extracellular matrix. The osteoblasts will then become surrounded by the extracellular matrix and then they develop into osteocytes. So they will mature into osteocytes. This process will form the bone ridges on either side of this periosteal blood vessel. The ridges will slowly enlarge and they will create this groove for the periosteal blood vessel to lay on top of. Eventually, these ridges, they will fold together and they will fuse. And this means that the groove will then become a tunnel that will enclose this blood vessel. The former periosteum now becomes what we call the endosteum that lines the tunnel because it will be inside of the tunnel. Therefore, it's endosteum instead of periosteum. The osteoblasts in the endosteum, they will deposit the bone extracellular matrix, forming these new concentric lamellae. And the formation of additional concentric lamellae will proceed inward toward the periosteal blood vessel. In this way, the tunnel fills in and a new ostium is going to be created. As an ostium is forming, the osteoblast under the periosteum will deposit new circumferential lamellae, further increasing the thickness of the bone. And therefore, as additional periosteal blood vessels become enclosed, as in step one, the growth process will continue and this will increase the width of the bone. There are several factors that will affect the bone growth that are listed here. They are actually going to be arranged in two different categories, the nutritional category and the hormone category. Because bone growth requires chondroblast and osteoblast proliferation, any metabolic disorder that affects the rate of cell proliferation or the production of collagen and other matrix components will affect the bone growth, as does the availability also of calcium and other minerals that are needed in this mineralization process. In addition, certain vitamins are important to bone growth in very specific ways. Vitamin D is necessary for the normal absorption of calcium from intestines, and we will see this at the end of this module. Also, vitamin C is going to be necessary for osteoblasts to synthesize collagen. With regards to hormones, they're going to be very important in bone growth. There's a hormone that's called growth hormone from the anterior pituitary that increases general tissue growth, like the name says, including overall bone growth by stimulating the interstitial cartilage growth and the appositional bone growth. Also, we have thyroid hormones that are required for normal growth of all tissues, including cartilage. Therefore, a decrease in this hormone can result in a smaller individual. And then the last one are the reproductive hormones that also regulate bone growth. We have estrogen, for example, is going to be the primary female reproductive hormone and testosterone is going to be the primary male reproductive hormone. And these hormones are important for bone growth as well.